Okay, so again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it's about one after one, so we will get started. Um, we actually have Gabby, our programs coordinator, helping on the technical side of things. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, we've actually had over 54 people register today. So um, that's really great. And I'm sure a few more will trickle in as well. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Kelly Sherman and I am the coordinator of the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. So again, we really do thank you for joining us today. So today's webinar, as you can see on the screen there, is preventing the introduction and mitigating the risk of spotted lantern fly in Canada. And our speaker, as mentioned, is Christine Villegas. I would actually like to formally begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Uh, while we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we do acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. So as you may know, the Canadian Council on Invasive Species hosted our first uh, successful National Invasive Species Awareness Week in May 2020, which featured a series of webinars and social media resources promoting Canadians to stop the spread of invasive species. So this year, the CCIS is participating in two invasive species work weeks in 2021. The National Invasive Species Awareness Weeks will take place, of course, in this month currently, and then May. So the objective of those, these weeks are to raise awareness of the invasive species issue among community members and stakeholders, share important information with partners to assist them with their invasive species work, as well as to encourage citizens to take action to prevent the spread of invasive species in Canada. So this week, as most of you are aware, we'll really focus mostly on information sharing, and that's why we're hosting a series of webinars. And then the second week um, will take place in, May, in the week of May 17th, and we'll more so focus on promoting partners and community members to take action um, through events, resource delivery, that kind of thing. So stay tuned for resources and toolkits about that week um, in late winter, early spring. So getting uh, right into the webinar, I'm really pleased to give a warm welcome and introduction to Christine Villegas, who is a senior specialist in the Invasive Species Invasive Alien Species and Domestic Plant Health Programs at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. She joined the agency in 2007, where she works on pathways of introduction of plant pests. She previously worked for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources as a conservation biologist, focusing on aquatic invasive species programs. Christine graduated from the University of Toronto and gained a diploma in geographic information systems from Niagara College and project management profession certification um, for, from the Project Management Institute. She is a proud mother of three children and loves sharing stories about her home country, Trinidad and Tobago. So as most of you are aware, her presentation is uh, today is on spotted lanternfly, which is a plant pest from Asia that impacts the grape and fruit crops, forestry, and can be a nuisance to urban areas. So Christine's gonna expand on what the CFA is doing in regards to that species. So at this point, I will pass the mic over. Great, thanks Kelly, and thank you for everyone who's um, attending today. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing some information about the spotted lanternfly with you and to get your initial feedback, comments, questions, um, uh, and feel free to, to jot them down in the chat or you can connect with me afterwards if you prefer. So, the CFIA's role in invasive alien species, especially when they're plant pests, comes from our authority under the Plant Protection Act. And the CFIA is made up of three main business lines. Um, so the, the plant health business line is the one that I work under. For plant health, then that authority comes from the Plant Protection Act. However, we also have to adhere to several international standards as set by the International Plant Protection Convention. And CFIA is, the, is Canada's national plant protection organization and is responsible for conducting pest risk assessments, which is done by our science branch, evaluating and deciding on risk management measures, um, done usually in collaboration with other branches, but mostly with policy and programs branch. And then we regulate import export domestic movement, promote compliance through outreach and awareness, 
and this is supported by our communications branch. And we also do verification of compliance with the regulations through our operation branch and local offices throughout Canada, which su get support from our labs and programs and, and other enabling branches as well. So it's, it's a well-rounded um, mature program that we try to include not only um, CFIA, but other partners as well, as you'll see later on in the presentation. So next slide, please. So today we're here to talk about spotted lanternfly. And before I continue, I'd just like to say a special thanks to the US Department of Agriculture, their animal and plant health inspection services and Pennsylvania State Extension for the beautiful photos and diagrams that they have given us permission to use throughout this presentation. So as you'll see, um, I, I was able to, to, to use a lot of their material um, in the presentation. Um, as Spotted Lanternfly isn't in Canada yet, it's very difficult for us to have our own um, images so far. Um, so Spotted Lanternfly, it's native to several countries in Asia, mainly China, India, Japan, Vietnam. Its preferred host is the Tree of Heaven. It's also known as the Chinese uh, sumac or stinking sumac. Um, the Spotted Lanternfly has been introduced to other countries, um, for example, in Korea where it is considered to be a pest of grapes. Uh, it's also been discovered in North America, in Pennsylvania in 2014. So the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture estimated that it had been there maybe a year or two before, based on um, the weathering of the egg masses that were found. And since then it's spread, it's invaded other states, including Ohio, um, Delaware, Maryland, New, New Jersey, New York, West Virginia, and Virginia. It's also um, not known to exist in Canada as yet. Um, it was added to the regulated pest list under the Plant Protection Act in 2018, following our pest risk assessment that was done in 2014, and then again updated in 2016, and is currently under review right now with new information that we've been able to um, get from based on its invasion in the US. Uh, unfortunately, this pest overwinters as eggs or in the egg masses life stage and is an excellent hitchhiker at almost all of its life stages, in particular, the egg um, mass stage. And it can, and it's easily moved through human activity. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a diagram, uh, one that I've been able to use from Pennsylvania State Extension Program. Um, so it clearly shows the different stages and timelines of those stages from egg to the four instars to adults. And then the laying of the eggs usually occur in the fall, so it overwinters. Um, there's one generation per year um, in Pennsylvania, but we expect the similar behavior or the same behavior in Canada if it does um, in, invade and, and become established. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, it shows the first to third Insta, which is that black and white. Um, nymph that you see um, in the first picture and the fourth instar it turns red with the black and white dots um, and that's the last instar just before it becomes an adult. Um, so April through July the nymphs are all flightless um, that's the first to the third instar um, and, and they all look similar except getting a bit larger each time. Um, so as I said before, they were wingless and black with white spots. The fourth instar emerges um, 
in the summer to early fall. And um, they are very strong jumpers and they often jump away when approached or prodded. Uh, the nymphs are highly polyphagous and so the, when the eggs hatch it's easy for them to find uh, a suitable host. They're known to feed on over 70 different species of plants um, and possibly more. And they, they feed with piercing, sucking mouth parts. Um, so other hosts that they're known to, to feed on are include grapes, apples, plums, cherries, peaches, nectarines, apricots, pines. They also are known to be on black walnut, especially um, oak and poplar. Their preferred host is the tree of heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Next slide, please. So the adults, uh, starting in late July, the, the fourth instar trans, transitions to adults and the spotted lantern fly adult is approximately an inch long and half an inch wide when it's at rest. So that's with the wings closed. They have red hind wings, which they show when they're startled or when they fly. But usually you'll see the spotted lantern fly at rest with their wings closed. They're not known to bite or sting anyone. Um, instead, they have long, thin, piercing mouth parts, uh, a proboscis, that they insert into the trunks and stems or leaves of the host plant and feed on the sap. The adults will usually feed on the woody parts of the plant and can present, can be in very high numbers. Um, so they, the adults, both adults and nymphs usually gather in very large numbers uh, on the host plants to feed. And they're easiest to, to spot um, later in, in the day, so at dusk or at night. As I mentioned, the adults prefer to feed on the tree of heaven. And it is suggested that in the absence of the tree of heaven, the development of the, of the pest may be slower in that it lays fewer eggs and fewer may hatch, but it can still complete its life cycle without the tree of heaven. The females lay eggs um, later on in the fall. So some, from December through this, September through December. Um, and that's the time of year that you would normally be looking for egg masses if they're, if you're transporting or moving things across the country. Um, the eggs, the egg mass is usually made up of 30 to 50 eggs. And then they're covered with a, a brown waxy substance, as you can see in the second picture. Um, the substance then turns um, harden and turns kind of um, cracked up, crackled look on it. So as I mentioned before, the spot Atlanta fly are great hitchhikers. Um, and they, they have a quite distinctive appearance, uh, not known, not likely to be mistaken for any of uh, Canada's native pests. So they can be easily identified in the nymphs and adult stages. And next slide, please. So here's a close-up picture of an adult laying eggs and then covering it with that waxy coat. Um, the female covers the eggs with the, the, the gray putty-like covering and it's shiny at first, but when it dries, it turns into that um, flaky crackled look over time. So these two pictures show the same egg mass taken four months apart. So you can see the difference in the, in the coloration and the texture as, it, as the covering deteriorates. And the eggs are laid on the smooth part of the, of the plant. Um, it's also laid on non-plant surfaces such as bricks and stone, lawn furniture, vehicles and other structures. The eggs then hatch in the spring and early summer and the nymphs will disperse looking for their hosts for feeding. Uh, next slide, please. 
where to look for a spot at Lanta Fly. So this is probably where I want to spend most of uh, the time. And so during our pest risk assessment, we, we look at different ways that this pest can be introduced into Canada. And there are many potential pathways. And we also look at where it can be established if introduced to Canada and what regions. Um, and this depends on the climate as well as host availability. So a recent study model of climatic suitability in Canada showed that most likely the highest risk areas in Canada would be Southern Ontario, as well as parts of Quebec and BC. Um, there's very little information about um, the cold thresholds of survival for uh, both adults and nymphs. However, um, the eggs, the eggs and egg masses are probably not going to be um, destroyed using standard cold storage. Or um, uh, and and it and it's thought that more than 15 days at minus 20 degrees Celsius is required for 100% um, destruction of the eggs. So the potential pathways of introduction. First of all, there they could be intent intentional importation. So this is where the spotted lanternfly um, is in imported as live adults or any other live stage that are still viable. Um, it's possible it could be in, in imported for uh, different uses. One being traditional medicine. Um, but this pathway has, has not yet been demonstrated in Canada as our records haven't showed any um, um, import requests or applications for that purpose. Uh, another way that um, spotted lanternfly could be introduced into Canada is through hitchhiking on fruits. Um, but this is also not considered a likely pathway as the nymphs and adults usually jump away quickly when disturbed. So the likelihood of them remaining on fruit during a transportation um, voyage is highly unlikely. Um, although they're known to be passed on grapes, they don't actually feed on the grape itself. Um, so that's another reason why they hitchhiking on fruits um, may not be a, a likely uh, occurrence. And the, then there's natural spread. So, and we also think that this is prob probably very low um, likelihood, um, or it may just be local at best because um, the spotted lantern fly are, are very, are poor fl flyers. Um, so they don't fly very far on their own. And the, the, the nymph stages are wingless, so they just move around by jumping, although they can jump pretty far, but it's not likely that um, widespread establishment is going to occur by natural spread. Um, so the other two pathways of introduction are on in infested plants. And this is a known pathway and it, and it can pose a risk when plants for planting, for example, are being imported from infested areas, either from the country of origin in Asian countries um, where spotted land and fly exists or from um, areas in the US that are infested. And the, the second pathway that is very likely and probably the the highest risk pathway is on inanimate objects. So these are bricks, wooden or concrete poles, rusty metal, stone slabs, wood pallets, wood dunnage, um, used cars, wheel wells. So anything you could think of that could remain outside and has a smooth surface where the uh, spotted landfly adults can lay their eggs um, are, are probably fair game for being uh, a mode of transportation for the eggs and egg masses. Um, these commodities are very difficult for um, to regulate as they don't fall into the normal realm of what CFIA would regulate under the Plant Protection Act. 
and they don't usually undergo any kind of uh, plant pest management treatment prior to importation or movement. So that's another complicating factor um, trying to manage this pathway. Uh, next slide, please. So this table is an excerpt of a checklist that's being prepared for homeowners or transportation companies um, as a kind of a reminder where to look for spot that don't apply and on things that um, probably you wouldn't normally think to look, look at. So it's, as you can see, it's a wide variety of items. Um, we've worked with our US partners um, and at APHIS to come up with a fairly comprehensive list. And I'm sure there'll be other things that we can add, but it's a good reminder to be diligent and look for egg masses prior to moving um, any of these objects or similar objects uh, while making sure they're also free from soil and pest and plant material before moving or importing to Canada. And that picture shows a, <clears throat> excuse me, a regular park bench, but as you can see, it can be quite inspicuous to the egg masses and difficult to spot unless you're actually deliberately looking for it. So this is the, the tree of heaven and the diagram, the images show some um, spotted lantern flies accumulating on the, the trunk for feeding. Um, there are some areas in Canada that do have the tree of heaven and they've been imported previously as an ornamental um, species. Um, so this is the spot that lantern fly, lantern fly is favorite um, or preferred host. And especially, this is especially for, true for the adult stage, life stage. Um, as I mentioned before, if this species is not available, the spotted lantern flies will feed on other hosts um, as, as, as is available. Um, but if the tree of heaven is there, then this is definitely their preferred host and they will go to it first. And in the US, they have used that uh, attraction as um, a way to manage the, their um, infestation of spotted land and flies. So what happens, they use it as a trap tree where they would um, remove most of the tree of heavens from um, one particular area, leaving only a few bait trees. And so the spotted land and fly would accumulate um, on that tree that they would have inoculated or then can have um, pesticides applied to just a, a concentrated area. So um, that's one of the ways that the US um, and some states such as Pennsylvania are trying to manage their infestation. Uh, the female trees are prolific and produce many seeds, several hundred thousand each year. Um, we have um, a research project that we're trying to get on the way with Ontario um, that's looking at the proximity of Tree of Heaven and Black Walnut um, close, close to vineyards in, in Southern Ontario. Um, just to get a sense of where those potential high-risk spots can be if there happens to be a, an, an introduction of spotted land and fly. And that would help with the planning and um, response that can take place. So there, there are several impacts that we can talk about with spotted land and fly. Um, because they feed on the plant sap of many different plants, including some of the forestry, important forestry and um, horticulture um, type species like maples and black walnuts, grapes and other fruit trees. Um, it, it could be a, a significant pest for those types of um, species and 
it could have an impact on on trade in live plants and potentially lumber. But uh, it's very difficult to understand how much of that will impact because we're still learning a lot about the pest and what it prefers and how it reacts to cold and extended winters. Um, however, in Pennsylvania, they have reported things like yield loss in their vineyards or loss of um, fruit quality. Uh, and sometimes in some cases it's, it's very high, like over 80% um, yield loss in, in, in the grape industry. What's good is that um, there may be many, um, I guess, control measures that are already in place in Canadian grape industry that would also uh, manage this pest. So there, there may be um, pest management, um, integrated pest management system approaches that some vineyards use or um, insecticides for other pests that may be applied that would also be effective on spotted lanternfly. So this is something that we're looking into as well. Another potential impact is um, when spotted lanternfly feed, there's a sooty mold that can result in, in due to their excretions. And this mold um, can also attract other insects such as bees and wasps. And so in, in an urban area, you can see how that can become um, a nuisance to having your furniture, your lawn furniture and your equipment and outdoor recreation vehicles, for example, covered in this sooty black mold, as you can see on that second picture, um, as well having it attract other pests that may be unwanted. So what to do if found? Um, so this is specifically for the egg mass. Um, as you can see in the picture, there it's been scraped into a Ziploc bag. But we ask that first a picture is taken and the location of the, the sighting is noted. And then the egg masses can be easily removed by scraping using, um, for example, a credit card or some other sturdy type of material. Um, to scrape all of the egg masses into um, a leak-proof bag, such as this um, zipper freezer bag. <clears throat> and it can be filled with um, alcohol or hand sanitizer and then sealed and the eggs can be crushed into the alcohol. And that is expected to fully destroy the egg mass. Um, and then we ask that people would carefully reinspect the area to make sure nothing was missed and some of the other smooth vertical surfaces that may be close by to see if there are other egg masses there. Yeah, so it's really important to double check materials and, and packing um, materials as well as the conveyance sort of thing that you're sending along in for adults spotted underflies and their juveniles and their their eggs as well. And CFA has a reporting page where you can go online to um, insert all of the information about a potential find. But you can also um, report pests through other, um, other venues such as iNaturalist and um, EdMaps. But we asked specifically if spotted land and fly is suspected that it be reported directly to the CFIA. So currently what's being done, um, as I mentioned before, we're updating our pest risk assessment with information that we've been able to get as uh, research continues and, and new things are discovered about the pest. We often update pest risk assessments. Um, on a, on a regular basis. So 
for a spot at Land and Fly that's being done currently. Um, unfortunately, it's not yet um, finalized. So uh, many of the, the updates I'm, I'm not able to share right now, but um, we anticipate that it would be finalized in the coming weeks. Um, so we've also been requesting additional information, especially on the economic impacts um, from the US and other countries where Spot Atlanta Fly has in, invaded. Awareness materials and social media posts and webinars such as this are also planned. We're working with our communications branch to develop a communications plan or outreach plan campaign for Spot at Land and Fly. Uh, we're hoping that it can be um, launched probably in March or, or April. And the awareness materials would be both available online and in hard copy. Um, social media posts we hope to do on Instagram and Facebook as well as Twitter. And uh, I think we have a couple more webinars and uh, presentations planned as well. So we're also looking at regulating um, plants for planting pathways, specifically for spotted lanternfly. And there's also consideration of, of where else regulations can help what other regulatory tools we have available to us for managing this pest. And um, we're kind of in a very good spot right now as it's not known to exist in Canada. So we can be proactive and preempt some of the um, potential pathways or areas where it can be infested, can be pre better prepared for it if, if and when it does come. Um, so the spotted lantern fly has also been barcoded and the code is deposited in the barcode of life project. Um, this can be very helpful when it comes to uh, identification, especially at the, the egg stage, life stage. We've also been working with um, the Canada Border Service Agency um, on and looking at different um, controls we can have in place at, at our border crossings, especially the land border crossings um, with states that are <clears throat> known to be infested or um, understanding the travel routes of different um, commodities that we import from the US and knowing that if it has come through a state that has spotted land fly, that it might be at a higher risk of containing that pest. So working with CBSA officers to help them understand about the pest, how to identify it and what to do if it is um, identified um, on conveyance or on a commodity or personal vehicle, someone traveling across the border. And we're also working with national and provincial partners on, on education and outreach and community science as well to try and raise the awareness of this pass, how it can be transported easily on regular household items that may be stored outside as well as what to do if you do come across the spotted pathway. Um, lessons learned from the US and other jurisdictions, um, that as well will be included in parts of the pest risk assessment, especially under the impacts. Um, and then there's several research um, projects either on the way or getting started or being developed to look at the cold tolerance um, as a potential treatment for this pest. And as I mentioned before, there's a project on the Tree of Heaven proximity to vineyards, but there are also other um, research projects that can help to clarify some of the information gaps that are mentioned in the spotted lanternfly um, pest risk. 
So what we're doing and what we're doing with partners, we're trying to prevent and slow the spread through education and outreach, traditional, both traditional and um, more, I guess, online types of media fora. Um, we're asking people to learn to identify spotted lantifly and know where to look for them and what to look for and what to do when you spot one. So to understand the import and domestic movement requirements that we have in place um, so that no one intentionally moves a viable live stage of spotted lanternfly and you know continue to collaborate with partners and and gather pests and host information and um, develop and evaluate further risk management options for different scenarios that we might be faced with in the near future. Um, one way we're hoping to work more closely with provincial, territorial, municipal partners and, and getting, um, getting risk management options on the table and looking at how they can be evaluated and what works best for one province may not necessarily work for another. So getting the coordination and ongoing intergovernmental information sharing, these things we can do now be, before the pest actually arrives. And this will help facilitate and support um, ongoing research and surveillance and management of spotted lanternfly if needed. Um, so we're also trying to promote the scientific and technical advancement of different um, development of lures and traps for detection um, possibly insecticide registration for control. Um, it's not known if any horticultural oils or any over-the-counter products such as RAID um, could effectively control um, spotted lanternfly, but it is possible. Um, so partners will continue to work with the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, PMRA, um, and looking for chemical control measures that can be applied in, in Canada for spotted land and fly specifically. And continue on doing research on pest susceptibilities and hosts for target detection, response, inspection, things like that. Um, so just want to end with this insect could invade and survive in, in some parts of Canada. Um, that we know of now, um, of course, that can change with climate with climate change and pest adaptation. That's why we think education and vigilance on on everyone's part will play a very important role in preventing this pest and at least slowing the spread um, or detecting it at very early stages before. Um, large scale establishment occurs so it can be controlled. Controlling the pathways of introduction can be very problematic as I explained, because the highest risk pathways are, are those that are not plants or plant products. Um, and that's why we think education is perhaps again, the most effective barrier to the pest entry um, into Canada. Um, and that's why we are really reaching out to partners and industry stakeholders and the public in general to keep your eyes open and to help with the prevention of this pest. It's something we don't have in Canada and we don't want. And actually being aware of this pest and looking for it can also effectively have a ripple effect um, and find other pests that may be using the same pathway of introduction and spread. So um, that's it for spotted lanternfly, but I do have one more slide. And this is a plug for our e-commerce uh, campaign that's going to be launched probably this week or next week. And it's basically to um, inform people that even though you're shopping online more than ever before, perhaps you haven't stopped to think about 
I'll realize that there are also health and safety requirements on online products, just the same as other items that are imported through traditional means. Um, so some of these products that are sold online can also pose a risk to plant health um, in Canada and, and they must still meet import and domestic movement requirements. Um, just because it's being sold online doesn't mean that it's uh, approved for import into Canada. So we're working with um, online platforms such as Amazon, Alibaba and, and others to, to help them come to the understanding that this is true for Canada and work with them to help inform their clients and customers that um, these goods that are being sold online can also be carrying invasive pests and um, can cause a risk to the country of import to their agriculture, forestry industries and natural resources. So it works both ways. So Canada doesn't want to be exporting plants, plant products, pests, invasive species to other countries. And we don't want um, uh, those things to be coming to Canada via um, purchases made online. So the main idea of the, of the campaign is to raise awareness about this. And <clears throat> because you as an individual may not think yourself as an importer, but when you are purchasing something from a different country outside of Canada, in effect, you are an importer. And so have to be aware of the import requirements as appropriate. Um, so you'll see more about this topic in the coming weeks. And you can also look <clears throat> at the CFIA e-commerce webpage for more information as well. The last slide is just to say thank you. And that's um, the Invasive Alien Species General um, uh, email account, which is checked daily. And if you do have questions that we don't get to today, you can feel free to send me a message there or directly to my email address, which is uh, christine.bejegas at canada.ca. I can share that with uh, Kelly to share with the group as well. And uh, that's it for today. Uh, I guess I can take any questions now. Great, thank you, Christine. So it looks like we have a couple questions going. So Lisa Scott says, in South Central BC, uh, the Okanagan and Simil, I hope I'm pronouncing this okay, Simil Kameen Valleys, they're a major grape growing region in Canada. They also have lots of tree of heaven. And they're already dealing with a recent invasion of the brown marmorated stink bug, which also uses tree of heaven as a preferred host plant. Now there's potential for the lanternfly invasion, but there's no regulations in British Columbia for the invasive tree, or just tree of heaven. And then the, there's also limited financial support to manage them. This seems uh, to be a major barrier. Do you have any advice for Lisa in, in terms of that question? Um, so actually the CFA is looking at the tree of heaven as a pathway. Um, but specifically for BC, um, perhaps um, if they do look at the, the risk um, with the tree of heaven, it can be listed as an invasive species. And then um, they would be in a better position to put more regulations on it, what, where it can be planted, what can be done with it. Um, the CFA is is looking at the work being done at the in the U.S. Um, where they are re removing tree of heaven um, because it's known to be the preferred host of the spotted lanternfly. So, um, on right now, the tree of heaven is not a federally regulated um, invasive species. Um, but if it is proven to be a factor in being able to effectively manage this pest, then um, that can change. Um, 
but for right now, because it's so early in the stages, um, I, I don't see it being regulated right now as it, as a as a plant pass but that being said it, it can be in, included and it will be included in our management strategy for spotted lanternfly where we will be um, where we can be asking people to voluntarily remove the tree of heaven um, if they have it on their property or at least identify um, that they that they do have it um, so we have prepared a tree of heaven fact sheet. Um, it's not finalized yet. It will be released with the launch of the Spotted Lanternfly um, Awareness uh, Campaign. And hopefully that would also help to spark people reporting where tree of heaven does occur. Um, and then that could be mapped. And the more the information we have about um, the location, um, the better it is that we'll be prepared to um, plan for their removal or their management, um, not just in BC, but in other areas in Ontario and Quebec as well. Um, okay, that's um, that was a very thorough and detailed answer as well. I was actually going to um, mention that as well. It just seems funny that an invasive tree species like Tree of Heaven, which is so precise, pervasive is the host for this also invasive species. <laughs> yes. Um, it seems ironic, but yeah, that's, and I guess some provinces or territories may regulate it. Like I know in Ontario, we have the Invasive Species Act. So I can't remember if Tree of Heaven is regulated under that, but provincially or territorially they may. So I hope that answered your question, Lisa. I also see um, related to that a little bit, a CFA willing to share a photo gallery to assist education and outreach done by partners. So yeah, like I know that's something we run into a lot is access to high quality photos that people can use for free. And if we're developing or other people are developing education and outreach materials, is there a way to access any photos from you guys? Or I guess you guys also have access to other people's in photos. Yeah, so we have very limited um, photos <clears throat> when it comes to spotted lanternfly. Um, but we do have some that are incorporated in um, the that credit card size um, mm -hmm. ID, identification cards, and that can be available as well. Um, we just had um, an, a, a new print done, so okay. um, that can be available. Um, it's also available in digital form online uh, on the CFI website. Um, we also have um, a poster on Spotted Lanternfly and the fact sheets, they have some pictures. What I can do is uh, go back to our partners in the US, um, you know, the USDA APHIS and ask if, um, if their um, photo gallery, because it's more extensive than ours, mm -hmm. is, can be shared um, with, with um, Canadian government and industry looking to do the outreach as well. Okay, yeah, I know that we get a lot of our photos and maybe this person's aware of that also from Bugwood or- Yes. Either Bugwood yeah. or, yeah. Yes, bugwood.org. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> they have a lot of high quality, as long as they're not used for commercial purposes, the images can be used for free. So that's yes. an option as well. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I have another question here. Last week, this uh, Anthony saw a great presentation on advancements in the field of sterile insect technique or SIT. Has this been explored for the lantern, for managing lantern fly it, or is it even applicable for the species? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the answer answer to this question if it if it is applicable to the species I know it hasn't been explored yet but it doesn't mean that it's not being explored right now um, sure. there's a lot of work being done on spotted land and fly and uh, I'm not sure if this one in particular is being done but um, it's definitely um, good to note and should do you know if anybody who is actually you know, interested in doing it, we would like to know as well. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that either, but if, uh, as Christine just said, if anyone's interested, maybe contact Christine or has more information, quickly ask. You mentioned there was a, like, I know you guys have already been doing a lot of education and everything. You have the postcard or the little credit card thing and the poster, but did you mention that there is going to be like a more formal campaign for Spotted Lantern Fly? Yeah, it's still, it's still in development right now. Okay. Okay. Um, and we're hoping to get some more partners like CCIS involved. Yeah. Um, I know we've reached out to you um, mm -hmm. uh, as well, and especially to, to help us with the um, community outreach and community citizen science type activities. Right. For both Spot Atlanta Fly and Tree of Heaven. Right. Okay. Um, how would, oh, I have one quick question. You mentioned that you did a reprint on the credit card. How would people get those? The, the actual printed version of it? Yeah. Um, they can send their information, like name and address, mailing address and quantity to, to me. Okay. Or to that IAS um, email and um, we can get that to them. And then I think I have one more uh, final question here. When will the risk assessment be completed? So um, the risk assessment update, the risk assessment is completed, okay. um, but we're just doing an update now because okay. we have some new information that um, would add to the, the um, economic impacts as well as the biology and ecology of the pests from, okay. um, from it being in Pennsylvania over a couple of years now as they have done. Right. Some, they have um, updated their um, their information as well. So um, that update is not finalized yet, but we expect it to be done um, within the next two or three weeks. I see someone's typing in the chat box here. Is that available to the public or online or? So generally the uh, pest risk assessments are not published online, but they can be made available upon request. Made available upon request. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's about two o'clock now. So I think we'll wrap up. So I just want to say, um, again, if we, I know we're running short on time. So if you have questions, Christine's email is there. So feel free to uh, email Christine. I apologize, Christine, if you get a lot of emails after this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's <true. laughs> but that's okay. We're all sharing information and learning. So say, thank you so much again. Um, this is very, very detailed and informative. So so thank you, Christine, and thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you again, everyone.